Good evening and welcome to The Connection. How's everybody doing this evening? Good, good. Have we got any announcements? Kira, give us one. Okay. Well, first things first, we are having a big block party uh, right out here in the uh, parking lot across the street at the big church. Uh, that is going to be Saturday, October 1st, so it's coming right up. Um, make sure you invite your friends, the public, anybody you see in the grocery store as kids, whoever you want. Just uh, everybody's welcome uh, inviting the public. So uh, get the word out and share it on Facebook. Okay, your block party, it is from? It's from 4 to 7.30 p.m. Okay. In the big parking lot, and they're going to have food and music and games. And so okay. that's Saturday right before the connection, right? It is. Starts right before the connection. We are still going to have our connection service, so if you want to come and enjoy the block party and then come in here for some nice, cool air and then go back out and rejoin the block party, you can. If you want to do the block party and not do the connection, you can do you, it's free will, you know, and so you can do whatever you would like. And if there's people at the block party that would like to join with us at the connection, we do some we do live worship here. We do uh, contemporary Christian music and you can get a little bit of cool air and enjoy some friendly fellowship and fun. OK, Kira, you got another one? I uh, yes, um, we're going to need some help next uh, Saturday at 2 o'clock, uh, handing out some flyers or going, uh, walking around the neighborhoods uh, around the church here, um, passing out flyers and uh, doing door hangers for this event. So um, anybody who's able to come and walk with us, that would be great. And then right after that, we're going to have our walking group starting up again. We were going to try to do that today, but it was a little too hot. So, so we'll start that next next Saturday. Okay, so you're walking. So your walking group still is kind of dependent on that real heat weather thing yes. back and forth. Okay, so right. we've we've still got a little bit of a little bit of hot weather back. Yeah, so we still got summer going, and that's a good good thing. Better than thirty below. That's for sure. I don't like the cold. Anything else, Kira? Um, I, th I think we're just doing the door hangers. Okay. Yeah, and that and Facebook. Um, okay. Oh, thank you so much. Coffee, tea, and V has been on break all summer, and right now we're not sure the exact date will resume, but it will be in October. So I'll be getting back to you later and announcing the time and the dates, uh, but it will be in October. It's coming soon. Nice, very good. So, uh, so our so our ministries that come out of this building here. Well, there's more than just that, but the ministries that are coming out of this building here, uh, they are fixing to fire back up. So we got a lot of excitement going on around that. Good block party. To, nice to be able to get out and meet and greet one another and and visit with our neighbors and our friends around the around town here. And so uh, we're going to have a good time. We're going to be uh, up and open and positive uh, to the event, and we're going to try to have the best time that we possibly can at this event. So has anybody else got an announcement? If not, let's stand and worship.
Christ. You may be seated. Would you pray with me, please? Good and gracious Heavenly Father, mighty God, we come before you, Lord. Oh, thank you so much for the weekend. I sure appreciate getting here this week, for sure. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you would be with us in this service, dear Lord, and stir that Holy Spirit inside of us, dear Lord, that we might receive your word. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen.
you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. There ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Who can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who could work it all for your good uh, let me tell you about my Jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave there ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my Jesus his love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life hallelujah For all my guilty Who would care that much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh, he makes a way Where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave There ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong And his grace is free And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. seen God this week I've got one right off the bat this music this music set that we just pulled right here that has been my saving grace pretty much all week long those songs have been playing in my head I know those are the ones we do a lot and we do them quite a bit quite a bit of time but those songs have been running through my head all week and boy I sure sure needed it and uh, God was in the mix for sure. Has anybody else got one? Where have you seen God? A prayer request, a joy, a concern? I have a joy. After having a procedure this week, I have been able to move around better than I have in over two years. And I just praise God for all that he does and all that he gives us in the way of doctors and their care. Oh, I yeah. just, I can't, it was been a, several hallelujah moments for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. praise Jesus. That's a good, that's a good one. And, uh, and the doctor's care, uh, I have a, 
I have a friend at my, at my New Hope congregation has had both of his knees uh, operated on and he has been down for several weeks in a row, uh, texted back and forth with him today and he walked 200 feet with a walker today. And so he is moving around now and starting to, and starting to get better and he's very excited about coming home. God is good all the time, all the time. Go ahead, Art. Well, I have a joy. Yes. The Chiefs won yes. again. <laughs> School. Where have that's, I seen that's God? That's a good this one, week? yeah. I've seen God everywhere this week. I, I, my biggest joy is my girl is feeling so much better. Amen. The treatments are working, and we thank God. We praise God, and we're looking forward to the next step. And we Amen. ask your prayers to continue, please. Uh, also, uh, last week I was miserable. My neck was so sore that I could not move my head. I couldn't sleep at night. It was awful. It was awful. A good friend prayed for me. Not only him, but many others prayed for me. And uh, I went to the doctor. I've had some treatments. And uh, my neck is so much better. Sweet. I feel great. Sweet. Today, I saw God and my daughter, my grandson, my daughter's boyfriend. They came over this morning. He heard that I was hurting. And he and my grandson cut trees and branches and burned timber and stuff. I mean, it was just amazing. Great. They did in an hour and a half what I couldn't have done in a whole week. I've seen God in so many places Amen. this week. Praise the Lord. That's a good one. Praise God. Praise Jesus. That's for sure. Boy, it's good to have good family around, isn't it? Man, it's great. Well, I was reminded of a couple of psalms this past week. Psalms 8. O Lord our God, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. For whose glory above the heavens is chanted thou among uh, babes. When I look at the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast established, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou carest for him? Yet thou hast made him a little lower than the mm -hmm. angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast given him dominion over the works of thy hands and hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatsoever passeth along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our God, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. Mm. And I think when we put uh, those verses in perspective, everything else can go better. Amen. Amen. That's, that's a good one. And boy, that's, that sure does speak to, speak to us and, and lets us, reminds us how come we are here. Uh, we have the dominion over all of the animals and the, and the plants and everything. We're set here to take care of God's creation, and that is a great psalm to tell us and remind us of that. Go ahead, Marilyn. And this goes along with that. I saw the most beautiful tree on the way over here. It's out on East Division. It, it's the most beautiful tree. I color is really dark red, and I was so surprised to see it turn so soon. Right. It's, it's just absolutely beautiful. And then I have a prayer request. My brother, Wayne Vest, is having health issues. Okay, okay. Does this come up in prayer? Anyone else got one? I have a joy. Go ahead. Uh, last night I got together with um, four of my friends from high school, and uh, one came from Florida, one came from overseas, where she and her husband are missionaries. And um, it was just great to see them. Um, the other two gals are local, and and uh, we just had the best time. It was just wonderful to see them and, and be able to visit with each other. Um, also have a prayer request for my sister who's having a lot of pain right now. Uh, her name is Dana. Um, so keep her 
Lord in prayer, Sam. Thanks. Okay. Okay, you're welcome. Good. Good one. That's a good one. Uh, has anybody else got one? Have we got one online or anything like that back there? I do, in the meantime. Go ahead. Um, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we prayed for a dear friend of Michael's and, and mine um, from uh, another church uh, that we used to go to. Uh, Nancy is her name. <laughs> and uh, Nancy had broken her femur, uh, her left femur, close to her hip. And she's 83 years old. And... Uh, just uh, very uh, lithe. She's just very, very trim, 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 trim. And so bones very, very, she looks very delicate. She is very delicate. And so she broke the femur, and you know how serious that is, uh, particularly at 83. And uh, wonderfully, they thought she was going to go through two to six weeks worth of um, rehab in a skilled nursing facility, but because of how she walked around in the hospital, they let her out. She is home. There are people who put in a ramp at her house for nothing more than a hug. She's moving very slowly, but she is progressing very well, and I believe that it is because of prayers like ours that go up for one another that healing does come in a variety of forms. Luke was a, was a doctor, the Apostle Luke. And God works through medicine. God works through science. God works through supernatural healing. All three, I believe, have hit our friend Nancy this week. And so I ask that if you would, understanding how many of us are in that position, that we continue to, to pray for people like Nancy and others who are in pain or who have received healing and need continual healing because God is there and he works these everyday normal miracles for us all the time. Amen. Amen. That's a good one. Anybody else got anything? Prayer request, joy, concern. If nothing else, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll follow this by the Lord's prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again, Lord, thanking you. We thank you, dear Lord, for all of the different ways that we see you, that, that you're at work in our life and in the world around us. We ask you, dear Father, to bless us as we take on this take on this tradition, dear Lord, that we have been set upon this earth, dear Lord, to take care of your wonderful creation. We ask, dear Father, that you would help us and strengthen us and have us have us to have the mindset of what we are supposed to do in this world. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with each and every one of the prayer requests, dear Lord, the ones that are spoken and the ones that are not spoken, dear Lord. You know our hearts and you know our minds. Be with us, dear Lord, as we come together to pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come into this time of Tithes and offering, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your gifts, your tithes, and your offering for the Bolivar United Methodist Church here in Bolivar, Missouri. Thank you so much for your support and uh, everything that you do. We've got a lot of different stuff that goes on here, and there, there's a lot of volunteers doing a lot of stuff around. And We've got Night to Shine that's coming up here pretty pretty soon. It is starting to get time to to uh, coordinate and get ready for that event. We've got we've got block parties. We've got all this fall stuff coming up, and so there's a lot of different places that you can be involved with the Bolivar United Methodist Church. And there and it's and it's a, and it's a great thing because we are in touch with our community around us, and we try to be in touch with with the community at large. And so it's a good it's a good opportunity to be in touch with people, uh, make connections with others. Uh, if you would like to be involved, Ashley, if you contact the office, uh, she can get you involved in something or uh, get you get you amped up to where you want to go or do. We've got three sir. We've got two services now. Our our uh, Sunday morning service has been combined. The early and the late service has been combined into one, and we've got this Saturday night service. And you're welcome to attend any one of those services that you would like uh, as far as our as far as our giving our tithes and our offerings you can you can donate uh, as you come in or as you go out of the connection here you can drop by the office you can push the button on on your on your Facebook page there are several different ways that you can be 
involved in the United Methodist Church, and I would sure do appreciate everything each and every one of you do. Thank you so very much. If you would join with me in a prayer of abundance. O oh, gracious, merciful, and abundant God, with thankful hearts we give you our praise, our offerings, and all that we are. Let the world see your generous nature working through us. Make us a reflection of your love. Amen. Choose your master. You knew it was coming, didn't you? As we're coming down through Luke, you knew it was coming. Chapter 15, we was in chapter 15 uh, last week. And so chapter 15 was all about seek and save. And so Jesus told three parables in chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son, right? And so chapter 15 was all about Jesus and how he come to seek and to save. Now, we hit chapter 16, and the whole chapter is about money and how we should operate in this world with money. And so our scripture reading today comes to you from Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. And it says this, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and he asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management. Because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking, my, taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm too ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job, here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcome into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whosoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with very much. So if you have not been trustworthy with handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all, these, all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of others, 
but God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Now, wow, that parable is pretty tough. It really is, and I, when, I, when I read it at first, I thought, boy, I want to dodge that. Can we go to something else? Can we talk about something else? There's 40 plus parables in the New Testament that Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples and to people. I know I didn't do full research because I was out trying to make money But at least one-third of those parables that Jesus Christ spoke was about money. And so, as I get to the point where I have to talk about money, I go, ooh, I don't like to talk about money. But you know what? It's necessary. When I look at this parable, I first go, wow, boy, why is that that way? Why can I not understand that? Why do I have so much trouble understanding this? Why can the Pharisees not understand it? Here's what I found. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 10 says this. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. This is the prophecy. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people, this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes to all things. And I found that, and I was like, oh, okay. So Jesus spoke in parables over and over and over again. And he spoke in these parables so that the people who were seeking God and were, and were trying to be, get close to God would understand what was being said. And the ones that were not, they wouldn't understand it. The Pharisees, they're sneering at Jesus because they loved their money. They loved their high place in society. They loved their classy robes. They loved their gold on every finger. They loved their... I'm above everyone else. Now, we've talked about this several different times. We've talked about it as, as the Pharisees uh, tried, to, tried to catch Jesus in, in uh, healing somebody on the Sabbath. And so there's several different times that we've talked about how these Pharisees had taken the law and they twisted it into something that it really wasn't. And here again, with this piece of scripture, is the same thing. Let's go back to our scripture. Luke's Gospel. And so as, I, as I'm going through this piece of scripture here, <clears throat> I find a few things wrong with it. And, and, when, I, and when you look at it, 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 make, it, it, goes, it makes you go, hmm, what the heck? Now, if I was the master and I had a manager of all of my stuff that was being honest and it was squandering my wealth, would I give him the opportunity to get all of his books in line and come back to me? Or would I say, no, you're fired. Pack your stuff and get out, and I'm going to have somebody watching you while you pack your stuff. 
a, a manager, a master, would do that. So immediately, when I start looking at this parable, I go, that master is not really a worldly master. Something's different about this master, right? This master is not really worldly. There's something different. He gives this dishonest manager the opportunity to go back and gather his books together and report back to him. Now, he was planning on firing him anyway, but he gave him the opportunity to come back and straighten and, and straighten and straighten his books out. So immediately this manager goes, "Oh, he didn't deny it. He didn't deny that he was being dishonest or that he was wasting his master's money or anything like that. He didn't deny it. He first thing he says is, "Oh, what do I do now?" What do I do now? And so he comes up with this plan. And so whether he was using his master's money or whether he was using the interest that he was charging on his master's money that he was loaning out or however that that was working, wherever this dishonesty came in at, it doesn't say and it doesn't really matter. Because here's the thing, the manager takes and he calls the master's debtors in and he says, hey, how much do you owe? Well, 900. He cut the bill in half. So as you research and as you read about this and as you try to figure out what this parable is all about, it it says, well, you know what? That was probably most of that half was the interest that the manager was charging above what, the mas what he actually owed the master. And it may have gotten into some of what was owed the master, but chances are it didn't. The second one was 80%. So we pretty much feel like that, yeah, that pretty much all was this interest that this manager was charging above and beyond what was owed to the master. So when the master says, well, I commend you for being very shrewd about this. So what this does in the eyes of the people that he's taken this bill and run it backwards on them. First of all, the shrewdness of this manager. What do he say? I need you to take your bill quickly, sit down, rewrite your bill in your own handwriting, and we'll turn that in. So, the manager can't get in trouble for that because you rewrote your own bill, right? I didn't do it. They did it. They took and they reduced their bill. And so the manager couldn't get in trouble for it, and he probably didn't care if he was going to get in trouble for it because he knew he was going to get fired anyway, right? But it made friends with these people that owed money. And so this manager, when you research the context around this most of these managers these rich these rich individuals at that time they had managers all over and they had money 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 and so they had something over here they had something going over here they had something going over here and each per place they had a manager managing that area of what was going on and so that manager that manager was given the house was running the household he was running everything that was going on there and he had a place to stay so when he fired the manager this manager all of a sudden, he was out of the house, too. I'm out on the street now. And so this manager, immediately when he thinks, okay, well, I'm going to get fired. I need to take care of me. I need to take care of self. So I've got some place to stay. If I reduce that guy's bill right over there, he's probably going to be my friend, and he's going to invite me to stay at his house and maybe even give me a new job. 
And so Jesus sees this, or the master sees this and says, you know what, that's pretty, that's pretty swift thinking there. So you either took part of my money, you dishonest dude, or you used part of the money that you should have got from interest to make a friend here. So you'd have a place to fall back on. And so if you notice at the front part of that parable, it says, so someone will let me stay with them, right? It just talks about, I know what I'll do, he says. When I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their house. At the first of this. Towards the last of it, after the parable is over, in verse 8 it says this, The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. That's the end of the parable. Jesus says, after this, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. And so he's talking about two different people, right? He's talking about the people of this world dealing with each other, their own kind, and they're tight. And he's talking about the people of the light, Christians. Now, when we think about this parable, what does it bring to mind? We're using the master's money. We're using the master's everything. Everything is given to us by God, children of the light. Each breath that you take, each dollar that you spend, each drop of gas you burn in your car, and the car, and the house, and the boat, and everything that you have is given by God. And when we turn our mind into thinking like that, each and everything that we have is given by God. And when we start using our resources, the things that we have, to develop friendships with others so that we can shine children of the light, so that we can shine the light of Christ on each one of them, that is using what God has given you shrewdly. Because you're using your money, you're using all of the gifts that are given to you to shine the light on others. Now, if you notice this next part, I will tell you, worldly wealth, now, in most versions, this, uh, this says worldly wealth. Uh, unexpected mammon is what that is, is called in most of the other, other versions of the Bible. And it says talking about money. So it says this, I, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. So that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Okay, so now it doesn't say welcomed into their house. Now you're going to be welcomed into eternal dwellings. This is Jesus. Now, if, now children of the light, he's speaking to us now in this parable. And so now when you use your worldly wealth, To make friends of your, for yourself and you shine that light on those friends and those friends turn right around and say, boy, I want some of that. And so all of a sudden they got Jesus in their, in their heart and if that friend passes away before you do, who's going to welcome you into the eternal dwellings? That friend that you shined the light on back years ago. You may not even remember that at this point, but that friend is over there. And they remember that you shined a light on them at one time, and they're going to be standing there at the gate when you enter, and they're going to welcome you with open arms, every one of them. 
And when I read that, I was like, okay, well, here's this part. And he's talking about worldly things and worldly people and those types of people. And now he's talking about us. And so this parable has got a lot of weird stuff going on in it. And it's, and it's really hard to understand if you don't just go through it piece by piece by piece and take it apart. Verse 10 says this, Whosoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whosoever is dishonest with very little is also dishonest with very much. So, if you have not been trustworthy, With worldly, possess, with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Worldly wealth, the things that we have here. The things that we have here, we think a lot of us have got a lot. And we, we think, boy, this worldly wealth, we've got to have it. It's just got to be there. And, and we think about it a lot and here's the thing I heard heard this I read this I read this in 80 years time if you're alive for 80 years 50 of those 80 years you're thinking about money how to get money how to spend your money where your money's going what you need to be doing with your money that's a lot of time spent thinking about money. Jesus knew, Jesus knew how much money and trade meant to us. He spent 33 years on this earth too. He knew exactly what money meant to every one of us. And he knew how vulnerable that we could be to that almighty dollar and how that almighty dollar could sweep us in. But on the other hand, if you think about it, the riches of this world mean absolutely nothing. They're, they pale in comparison to what we're going to have on the other side. And if we don't think this is a testing ground for each and every one of us, our mindset is wrong. This world that we live in and the small bit of time that we spend here is a test and it's only a test I had a friend one time and this friend was a poor individual like myself and the Lewisburg picnic was coming up I don't know if how many people have been to the Lewisburg picnic. About everybody around here has been to the Lewisburg picnic at least once. We used to go every year, and the big thing at the Lewisburg picnic was to buy a fish sandwich. Had to have a fish sandwich. You went to the Lewisburg picnic, you hadn't been to the Lewisburg picnic unless you bought a fish sandwich. So the young man and I, we were getting ready to go to Springfield with mom and dad. Now, we were young. We were, were pretty small. And the young man wanted to purchase something. He just wanted to have some money. So if he seen something that he needed, he could buy it. So he went to his dad. And his dad said, okay, here's what I'm going to do for you, son. I'm going to give you $2. And you know that the Lewisburg picnic starts tomorrow night. So, whatever you come back with of those $2, I'm going to times that times 10, and that's what you're going to take to the Lewisburg picnic tomorrow. So, if you spend all of that $2, you get nothing. If you spend a dollar of that $2, I'm going to give you $10 when you come home. If you spend a dollar and if you spend... 50 cents of that $2, I'm going to give you $15 when you come home. He says, okay, okay, gotcha. 
So off we went, got in the car with mom, and we went to Springfield, and we were at the mall, and we were having fun, and boy, you go to the food court, and man, the first thing you smell is those funnel cakes and corn dogs, and, and man, you're just starving to death, and it just, it just pulls, it draws you to it, doesn't it? I mean, it's just crazy when you go into the food court there at Battlefield Mall. It's just crazy, and I could, I could see him. He kept rubbing this pocket right over here, rubbing this pocket, and he had that two dollars in his pocket. He kept rubbing that pocket, and so we, he never did pull it, never did pull it out, and so we went, and we we piddled around there at the food court for a while, and then, and then we didn't have to go to Toys R Us at that time because it was back when I was young. So they had all kinds of different things in the, in the mall, and they had toy stores and all kinds of different stuff, and we'd go into the store, so toy stores, and we'd walk around in there, and there was tons of stuff that just drawed you to it. And he got to the point where he took that $2 out of his pocket, and he was holding it like this, and he was rubbing on put it back in his pocket. We finally left the mall that evening and he had not spent one dime of that two dollars. Not one dime. Now, brothers and sisters, for a 12-year-old kid, that's some self-control. I will guarantee you that because I couldn't do it. I spent every nickel I had in the mall that day and I didn't have much, but I had, had a little bit and I took it all with me, and I spent every bit of it. Well, Lustberg Picnic opened the next night. We went to Lustberg Picnic. My friend had $20. $20. And that was a lot back in the day. I mean, you'd go to Lustberg Picnic, you'd ride all night and eat all night on 20 bucks, no problem. You can't do that now, but you could then. We walked into the Lewisburg picnic, him and I, and Mom gave me some money because I'd spent all mine the day before. Mom gave me a few dollars, and I, we walked into the Lewisburg picnic. We was going to get us a snow cone, just walk around for a while. And there was a young lady standing there by the vending area, and she looked really sad. My friend went up to her, and he said, he said, uh, he said are you okay? Yeah, I am. I would like to some cotton candy, but I haven't got any money. My friend said, well, you know what? I'll buy you some cotton candy. I got $20. And so he got in line, and he went up, and he got this little gal some cotton candy. And they walked around. He completely left me alone. I had to walk around by myself all evening long. And every time I'd see him, they would be closer together closer together pretty soon they're arm in arm and they're rubbing shoulders as they're walking around they rode all night and they ate all evening on that twenty dollars and we went home and my friend said boy I really like her she's nice I talked to my friend a few days ago and he said you know what Michael he said, that was the best $20 I ever spent in my life. Still with the same gal that he met at the Lewisburg picnic that night. Still with her. Still with her. Now, if we think about our money and how we spend and how we reflect on others, my friend was very backwards and very shy individual. He was. He wouldn't hardly talk to a girl. And that $20 in his pocket gave him the nerve to say, hey, are you okay? Well, I'd like some cotton candy. And he said, I'll buy you some cotton candy because I got $20. And so that $20 helped him to reflect on someone that he would have never even talked to if he hadn't had it in his pocket. So this worldly wealth that we're blessed with, everything that God gives us are tools 
each and everything that we give us. We're blessed uh, to be able to play the guitar, or we're blessed with be able to sing, or with, we're, we're, if we're blessed with dollars and cash, it's tools. Everything that we are blessed with is God-given in this world, in this life, each and everything. It isn't all about money. This parable is about money because that is, that is what we need to survive here. It's about the tools and how we use things that God has given us to reflect on others. It's not about us scraping and scratching and gathering all of these things together to make sure that we have something for the next year or three years or down the road somewhere because you know what? God takes care of each and every one of us and he will continue to take care of us. We use our dollars to benefit others is what this parable is telling us. And so the Pharisees looked at this, they're listening to this, and they're lovers of money, and all of a sudden they're going, really? Seriously? God has blessed me with all this money because I'm righteous and that's why I look the way I do. That's why I've got this big fancy hat on and all this. You see the gold on my fingers? That's because I'm righteous. That's not what that was meant for. But that's the way they thought about it. They thought the poor and the needy, the reason that they were poor and needy was because that they were not righteous, that they were sinners. That's not the way this is. We are supposed to, if we are blessed, if we are blessed and able to help others, that's what we're supposed to be doing with what we're blessed with. If we're blessed with monetary value, if we've got money and we are blessed with that, we are supposed to help other individuals that are not as fortunate as we are. And basically, if you look around us here at the Bolivar United Methodist Church, that's what we do. That's what we do. We work at the food pantry. We help others. We, we donate here. We donate there. And as church members, as we are together and we discuss what we do and how we take our money and we put it here, we put it there, or we, or we, uh, uh, or we, or we help out UMCOR and those kinds of things that the, our ministries are all about, that's what we as Christians are supposed to do as a Christian unit, as the body of Christ, and as each and every individual also. We're supposed to do that. That's how we are supposed to act and how we're supposed to be responsible. That's good stewardship. And so this bad example that Jesus uses here gives us a great lesson and the opportunity to realize what this money thing is all about. I know we talk a lot about money and how we're we're in need, and you know, yes, we yeah, we all we always need we need dollars, but uh, but you know what? We need those dollars to help others in our community, the ones less fortunate than us, because you know what? I sometimes feel that I'm very misfortunate because I haven't got a real lot and I've, you know, and I've squandered away a lot. I've thrown money here and I've thrown money there. And I, and, I, and I think about, you know what, I could have some money if I would have hung on to it a little bit better, but you know, it's okay. It's okay. Because we all are helping one another and that's how we are as Christian individuals. We all reach out to one another. We help one another. We help each other in times of need. I have never, ever, not one time in my life ever had to go hungry. I've never lost anything because I didn't make the payments. I've always kept my kids fed. They've always had clothes on their back and shoes on their feet. I've been a single parent for most of my adult life and a construction worker on top of it 
And brothers and sisters, I tell you what, you just don't know. You learn to trust. You learn to trust really fast when you're in that position. And I know there's a lot of single parents out there because the divorce rate is high in this country. It really is. There's a lot of single parents out there that are just scratching and scraping and trying to feed their kids. And there's some of us in our country that will grab a hold of all this monetary wealth and just hang on to it. Why? You cannot take it with you. You can't take it with you when you go. It stays right here. So if you have millions of dollars, you may lose your life tomorrow and the millions of dollars will just sit there and someone else will take them over. Why would you not share what God has given you with others? It blesses your heart. It makes you feel good about something in your life. It really does. It really does. Have you ever helped anybody out? Yeah, every one of you. I can see you nodding your heads. Every one of you have. When you help someone out, it blesses you. It makes you feel good. Why would you ever think that you would miss an opportunity like that? It's beautiful. It's wonderful. So, the parable about money I don't like to talk about money a whole lot, but you know what? This was good. This was good. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with that because it's really not about money. It's about sharing what we have with those that are less fortunate than we are. And that's what it is. That's what it is. Jesus Christ done it. His disciples done it. And the example has been set in front of us to do the same thing as Christian individuals. God bless each and every one of you. If you stand.
pray with me please good and gracious heavenly father mighty god we ask dear father that you would help us dear lord to always be able to decipher your your parables dear lord and to, and to and to help us to understand each and every one we ask dear father for your wisdom and your knowledge and your and your help in understanding your words we ask dear father that you would be with us as we leave this place and and help us dear lord to to establish what we are supposed to do with all the things that you have given us all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us we ask dear father that you would lead us guide us and direct us in jesus precious and holy name we pray amen as you carry the light of christ out into the world this week remember someone is watching you be the light